Um, you already know a little bit of my background. Um, we woke up to about five inches of fresh snow after already receiving eight a few days ago, and we have another um, eight to 12 forecasted. So I originally planned to give this webinar for my office on campus, um, but I woke up to a message saying that campus was closed until 10 a.m. And so I just thought uh, I would uh, stick at home and, uh, and wait to get plowed out. Um, one of the um, you know things that we have to put up he with here in Northern Minnesota. And for those of you who aren't aware of where I'm located, if you're familiar with the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, uh, the Twin Cities area in Minnesota, I'm about two and a half hours north of that, which may make it seem like I'm close to Canada, but there are still another, it takes me about three hours to get to the Canadian border uh, from Duluth. So uh, Duluth is a very long state um, for those who haven't been here. Um, and so today's webinar, um, you can see we're going to chat a little bit about acceptance and commitment training. Um, some of you may hear it referred to as acceptance and commitment therapy when it's used outside of um, clinical applications. They've been referring to it as acceptance and commitment training or ACT. And um, I have over the past um, year now um, had been um, self-studying ACT um, on my own um, more so for personal development, and then saw um, through my own self-study and applications um, to things in my own life, I um, started experimenting and thinking about how I could use this in the OBM coaching and consulting that I do. And so um, today's webinar really is going to be pretty basic. I want to give you an introduction of the ACT model and psychological flexibility and provide uh, a, an overview of the core processes associated with ACT, um, highlight some of the relevant research um, that has that is currently published on the effectiveness of ACT in the workplace. And there's a lot of uh, research that's ongoing that hasn't been published yet um, that, that will be coming out um, hopefully in the next couple of years. <clears throat> and then finally, chat a little bit about how I feel that acceptance and commitment training could really be used to enhance the leader and manager uh, professional development initiatives that some of you are already doing or hoping to do post-graduation. So let's get started. And I'm going to let you know that this is the first time I've given this presentation, so um, I would appreciate uh, afterwards, if you have any feedback on things that I could add or clarify uh, for future um, presentations of this type of material. So acceptance and commitment therapy is uh, the first applied approach that's based firmly on relational frame theory. And essentially, the outcome of ACT is really meant to be a process that facilitates someone's ability to do what works for them in order to get where they want to go. Um, and ACT in and of itself is meant to be a flexible approach. So it's not meant to be a specific set of techniques. And one of the things that I thought that was really interesting in um, one of the books on um, acceptance and commitment therapy is that they state very specifically that it's not necessarily a therapy per se, but more of this general perspective. And, um, and so therefore, acceptance and commitment um, training techniques can be integrated into a more general um, psychological strategy. Um, there, in the research that has been done, they've looked at very short interventions that could be just a matter of minutes or hours up to interventions that might um, be um, more um, thorough and may include many sessions. Um, they've used um, acceptance and commitment training with groups, with individuals. They've used it in a variety of settings, such as classroom settings, workplace settings, um, and also in, in clinical applications, um, such as couples therapy. So ACT really incorporates techniques that are designed to solve the problems that tend to transpire as a result of human language and thought. So those 
things about language and cognitions that get us stuck. Um, and when we get stuck, or um, and, and getting stuck is one of the terms that they like to use for the general public in, in trying to understand um, the purpose and premise of ACT. Um, but essentially what happens is through our complex um, human language and, and cognition abilities, we can form these very rigid and inflexible rules. And because of those rigid repertoires, um, it causes us to get stuck and therefore prevent us for, from um, making decisions that are aligned with our values and allow us to move toward the goals that we have set for ourselves. And so ACT really aims to alter the function of those private events, of those thoughts um, and, um, and other cognitive inner experiences in order to promote psychological flexibility. And um, as a result of improved psychological flexibility, we should be able to contact the present moment, and we'll talk about what that means um, later on, um, reduce the control of those um, problematic thoughts and cognitions, um, connect, better connect with our, our personal values, who or what is important to us, and as a result, then commit to acting in a way that is more flexible, is more effective, and works for us. Okay, so there are six essential sub-processes in the ACT model that support our ability to move in the direction of our chosen values. Um, and there are also several um, kinds of relations among these sub-processes. I'm not gonna go into detail about those relations as I'm not yet well-versed in RFT, um, but you'll get a glimpse of these relationships as I go through the next few slides. So each sub-process in this ACT hexagon that you see on the screen um, is really a model for a coaching-related intervention if you are going to work with a leader, a manager, or a coach. Um, and these interventions then are going to help improve or aim to prove the behavioral repertoires and allow then individuals um, or you as the coach to pinpoint measurable and practical um, target behaviors for change. So the first sub process is acceptance. And um, according to relational frame theory, uh, it suggests that as human beings, inevitably, we are going to encounter aversive private events. And that can be even in the absence of any external aversive stimuli in the environment. Um, so the private events in and of themselves are not dangerous. Um, but if we struggle and attempt to avoid covert behavior, those private events, then that struggle and avoidance of our covert behavior could manifest into ineffective overt behavior. And so ACT focuses on the acceptance of those private events, not of the public events. Um, so it, it's not um, something in which we would have the leader, the manager, um, client, um, try to tolerate a challenging or difficult external event um, because often it's really their job to change that problematic external event. So what we want to do when we are using ACT with leaders, managers, and coaches is help them to be willing to accept those problematic thoughts and, and in internal experiences. So things such as frustration or anxiety or anger um, that inevitably tend to show up alongside challenging external events. And still, while they're experiencing those, those internal struggles, continue to take effective action towards solving the problem that they need to address. Um, and there are a wide variety of acceptance methods that can be trained to help people um, become more willing to kind of um, to accept those internal um, problematic thoughts and cognitions. Okay, cognitive um, diffusion is the second sub process. Sometimes it's just referred to as diffusion. Um, and with this sub process, um, we're really targeting the way that we relate to language. So while acceptance 
aims to assist with problematic feelings and emotions um, or sensations. Diffusion focuses on challenging private verbal events. So our thoughts are self-talk. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I have a pretty consistent internal dialogue going on throughout the day. Um, and sometimes I like that dialogue and sometimes I'm not so happy with that dialogue. And when the thoughts um, that are taken literally influence us to act in a problematic way externally, um, this is when we would say that fusion has occurred. So when fusion occurs, our thought patterns become very rigid and we're less likely to engage in collaborative efforts um, in order to solve um, a problem or come up with a solution. Um, so for example, you might identify with the thought, I am not worthy, therefore I'm going to engage in self-sabotaging behaviors or this problem that I'm encountering is unsolvable and therefore I'm just going to give up altogether. Um, and so diffusion techniques are really um, a, are a part of ACT so that they can help the individual see the thoughts for what they are um, and um, there are and, and, and simply see them as, as thoughts. Um, so not identifying with the thought. Um, and there are um, one of the most common techniques for diffusion is something called word repetition. And um, so for example, there, there are multiple steps to um, this technique, but at the end of it, um, or one part of it is where, um, let's say that we're looking at the word milk, we would have um, the client say the word milk over and over and over for a period of one to two minutes. Um, and at the end of that one to two minutes, um, the, the aim is that the function of the verbal stimulus milk will have changed. Um, so diffusion and acceptance kind of work together. They, they relate to one another and work together as a functional unit. And we can um, kind of more broadly um, describe them as these are the sub-processes that um, relate to letting go. If you've ever heard of letting go um, of those things that don't serve you anymore, those thoughts, feelings, um, emotions. Okay. Um, self as context is the third sub process. Sometimes um, this is referred to as perspective taking in, um, in other diagrams of the model. Um, and this has to do with your own private experience. Um, so you are at the center noticing with curiosity, without judgment, um, and you're the only one within the context who can um, notice and perceive internal and external experiences from your point of view. So this is your unique perspective and it's a nonverbal viewpoint. Um, and so within the context of really any challenging um, situation or obstacle that we encounter, um, psychologically flexible individuals would be able to notice uh, various types of thoughts and emotions simultaneously. So for example, um, if you're facing a, a challenging situation, you might say, I'm not competent to deal with this problem. That might be a thought that comes through your mind. I'm not competent to deal with this problem. At the same time, another thought might cross your mind um, in which you hear yourself saying or thinking, I'm a well-trained problem solver. Like I have these problem solving skills. So at the same time, you're having two conflicting thoughts and you're simply noticing that they're both there, not judging, but you are the only one um, noticing that they exist within the context of the situation um, at hand. Um, contact with the present moment is the next sub-process, and this one is important. Um, oh, hurricane. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry, you guys. The snowblower is going past. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry. Um, okay, so contact with the present moment. Hurricane. Okay. 
um, environment and behavior um, intersect in the current moment. So the only time that we can take action is in the present moment. Human language and cognition, though, have a tendency to pull us away from the present moment. So you might find that some of your thoughts are related to things that have happened in the past, um, as well as those things that might happen in the future. So our, our language and our cognition, cognitive abilities tend to pull us away from the present moment. Um, one technique that is commonly used in, in ACT um, is breathing. So, and part of the reason that breathing is used is because breathing is always happening in the present moment. It's happening right now. Um, so it is really a very simple and universal teaching tool um, that can help individuals come into contact with the present moment. And so um, a lot of times just in my own um, practice or in individuals that I work with, um, I will often um, talk about the use of breathing techniques, um, even if it's just three, taking a moment to do three deep breaths. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons why contact with the present moment um, is is, is essential for um, leaders and managers is because the more that they are able to be in the now, so to speak, the more accurately um, they are going to be able to perceive both problems or situations um, that are necessary to solve, as well as to be able to um, recognize potential resources they have um, that can be useful in solving the problem at hand. Um, in addition, if they are present, they are more likely to commit to value-directed actions. Um, so self um, as context, as well as contact with the present moment, both involve um, verbal and nonverbal aspects of kind of being in the here and now, um, or more colloquially, um, we might refer to this as showing up. So um, these pro processes are also at the center of the hexagram that you see on the screen because these two sub-processes are really central to all of the other processes. I think the snowblower has gone away, so we should be okay now. Um, values, um, I see values as really being one of, um, it, one of the most important um, sub-processes, at least when starting um, with ACT, and I'll chat about that a little bit later on too. Um, ACT, um, practice the, ACT focuses on um, teaching people how to better use their values. Um, and Hayes et al. define values as verbally construed desired global life consequences. So essentially, values are representing who and what is important to us, and they give our actions meaning. Um, values kind of set the context for the why that is um, associated with goal setting. Committed action is the sixth sub-process, sub um, and the aim of ACT is to help the individual make committed actions that are founded on a clarified value system. Um, so once they've identified and clarified their values, then they can commit to actions that are aligned with those values. And as behavior analysts, uh, we know that any empirically supported behavior change intervention um, needs to include measurable overt progress um, that is moving in the direction of our goals. So therefore, um, committed action really represents our ability to persist um, or to change our actions, our measurable behaviors, in a way that's aligned with what works, um, with and works to move us in the direction of our values. So in this part of the ACT model, we really see the types of interventions that are related to improving leadership and management um, behavioral repertoires. And both values and committed action involve um, positive uses of language, um, and in, in, in order to kind of go forth um, on our chosen course of action. So they're about getting moving.
So this then is the overall ACT model. Um, and you can see the lines inside um, the hexagram um, illustrate the several kinds of relations among these six subprocesses. And basically they're interrelated. They have reciprocal effects with um, one another and the development of um, one another. And um, so if you're interested in learning more about the specifics um, underpinning all of those relations, that's where you'll want to go back and um, really become well-versed in RFT. And that's something that's on my um, to-do list. Um, within um, or the sub-processes themselves can really be chunked into two larger groups. So on um, the left side of the hexagram, you see the acceptance and mindfulness processes. And then on the right side, you see commitment and behavior change processes. And so therefore, that's how um, kind of the name acceptance and commitment therapy or acceptance and commitment training came about. And so the essence of um, acceptance and commitment training work is really um, having to do with that area in the center of the hexagram. And, um, and what that is, is really... Um, is the answer to a central central question. Um, and it's a multi-component question that um, combines all six sub-processes. So the question is this, given the distinction between you and kind of all the junky stuff that you're struggling with and trying to change, um, so that's the first question. Um, are you willing to have that junky stuff fully and without defense, without judgment, as it simply is, not as what your thoughts are saying it is. Um, so not taking those thoughts literally. And continue to do what takes you in the direction of your chosen values at this time, in this present moment, um, within the context of the situation at hand. So if you can answer yes to that very long multifaceted question, um, then we would say um, that you've built or come um, to a point of psychological flexibility. So acceptance and commitment training uses acceptance and mindfulness processes as well as commitment and behavior processes to produce greater psychological flexibility. So that kind of brings us to um, the formal, um, the definition of psychological flexibility. And here you can see, I just pulled um, the definition that they gave on the ACBS website, which is the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. Um, and in a, in a more informal way, I've described um, psychological flexibility as referring to noticing and accepting private events, our thoughts, emotions, and urges, mindfully and in a non-judgmental way, and committing to choose goal-directed behavior that is values-aligned even in the presence of difficult situations or negative experiences. Um, research has shown that um, improvements in measures of psychological flexibility have um, related or correlated with a reduction in psychopathology measures, um, as well as an increase in measures of well-being and um, also over measures of value consistent behavior. Um, and so there are um, validated scales for psychological flexibility um, that are available and you can access them on the ACBS website. Um, so that's one way um, that we can demonstrate kind of overall um, effectiveness of, of ACT in um, the in, when we're evaluating um, the work that we're doing with leaders, managers, and coaches. And um, I know Frank Bond has also um, d has worked on a questionnaire um, that brings, that takes the current uh, measure of psychological flexibility even closer to the workplace. Um, and so um, if you look at the, the literature and look at the resources, you can find those measures um, to show improvement. Um, at this time, Dennis, are there any quick questions before I move on to the next se section? Far so good. Awesome. Okay. But if the audience does have questions, feel free to type in. in and I'll chime in. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to move into um, some of the most relevant um, research related to ACT in the Workplace. Um, before I start there, I just want to highlight um, just some of the more recent um, research on employee well-being um, so that we can get a, a sense of the types of stressors that show up um, in the workplace because a lot of the ACT interventions that have been applied have been applied in the workplace um, are aimed at reducing employee stress and increasing general employee well-being. And so one of um, so I, this is one of the things that I think is really exciting because I know that there are um, not sure how many of you are present on this webinar, but I know that there are a lot of individuals who have an OBM or ABA background who are interested in how we can improve the general health and well-being um, of employees in the workplace. And so um, as you know, we're well aware, there are several types of work-related stressors, and we would um, we are likely to be able to um, co counteract the negative effects of um, these stressors through our general OBM interventions. Um, but work-related stressors are also um, impacting other areas of the employee's well-being. And, um, and so this is why I think it's really critical, and this is an area where um, I think um, we as OBM professionals can make um, a large impact, not only on increasing and improving performance in the workplace, but making sure that we're doing it in a way that supports employee well-being. And uh, because I really see the impact on employee well-being being the responsibility of both the individual themselves as well as the organization um, in order to support um, the employee's ability um, to, um, to be well. Um, so this is one of the most um, cited um, early um, studies on the application of ACT in the workplace. Um, at, and, and one of the reasons that it's so important is it was a randomized um, clinical um, trial in RTC, uh, or RCT, sorry. Um, and the title of this study was Mediators of Change in Emotion-Focused and Problem-Focused Worksite Stress Management Interventions. Um, and for this study, 90 volunteers with the BBC in Europe were randomly allocated to an acceptance and commitment therapy group. Um, and that group sought to enhance people's ability to cope with work-related strain. It was an emotion-focused um, intervention. Um, another 30 were um, randomly assigned to an innovation promotion program that helped them to identify and then innovatively change causes of occupational change, strain. Um, so this was a problem-focused intervention. And um, then another 30 were um, randomly assigned to a waitlist control group. Um, so as you can see, um, for the effects on general mental health, um, and it's important to note that um, for this measure, lower scores are better, okay? Um, so if we see high scores, it means that their mental health is um, at a lower, um, um, was rated lower than um, they had. A, the higher rating is associated with a higher number of negative mental health events and situations. Um, and so here you can see um, that those in the ACT group had um, a, a statistically significant um, positive change on their mental health. Um, both interventions, the ACT intervention and the um, IPP intervention, lasted nine hours and were spread over three months. So in terms of what those interventions look like um, in length and duration, they were the same. Um, and the other, um, they, they, looked at measures of job satisfaction and intrinsic work motivation. They did not see a difference there, but where they did see a difference was on this measure of propensity to innovate. Um, and with this um, measure as well, um, or with this intervention, higher scores are better. And what I 
found that was very interesting here is that both the innovation group and the act training group were equally effective at in increasing the propensity to innovate, um, which this is innovating new approaches to reduce worksite stressors. But what they found is that the, um, the act training group um, did not intentionally target innovation as an outcome. So um, really, um, what happened with um, what happened here, and what's significant to note is that the reason that we see um, an effect on the propensity of, of innovation um, with the ACT group is that they were able to accept those um, problematic thoughts and cognitions. Um, so the, this relationship is mediated by acceptance um, versus the um, IPP group, they were effective, but it was because they figured out ways to change or avoid. Um, and so we can see it's, it's kind of looking at it as this is a more positive approach. You know, in OBM, we talk about, um, you know, both punishment and, um, and positive reinforcement um, techniques can be effective from the manager's point of view. But if we want to get that above and beyond discretionary effort, if we want to use a more positive approach, we focus on positive reinforcement. Um, techniques. So here it's like they can get similar results, but the more positive approach overall would be the use of ACT. Um, and then this slide is just showing you um, the number of other um, outcomes that have been associated with improved psychological flexibility um, in work um, related research. Um, so here we can see um, things such as improved work performance and improved mental health. Um, um, in uh, another study by um, Bond and Boots, they found that those who were uh, more psychologically flexible were less likely to commit work-related computer input errors. Um, there was a significant positive correlation with acceptance and job satisfaction. Um, there were higher um, higher levels of psychological flexibility, predicted men better mental health and job performance on a newly trained task. Um, and they've also found that among practitioners who received um, ACT training, um, they were more likely to um, continue to use the training that they received. So um, this might be an area where we're able to enhance transfer of training um, in, um, in, from the training environment to the work environment and sustain um, that training long-term once we're out of the training environment. Um, another area that I thought was, uh, another um, effect that I thought was um, really interesting um, and in, um, in traditional IO, they talk a lot about emotional contagion and emotional intelligence. Um, and, um, and emotional exhaustion. And so here, psychologically flexible employees also were able to better um, attenuate exhaustion levels throughout the day. And by the way, all of the um, references that you see at the bottom of the slide, at the end of my slideshow, which I think um, somehow I can make available to everybody who um, has registered for the webinar, I have the full citations um, for those references for you. Um, this is another diagram that I came across that might be of interest, especially to those um, who, do, who are more familiar with the traditional I.O., industrial organizational psychology literature um, and want to see how um, ACT processes, um, those psychological flexibility sub-processes relate to um, kind of the traditional construct of psychological well-being. Um, and Robertson and Cooper um, define psychological well-being as the affective and purposive psychological state that people experience when they are at work. Um, and so ACT is really offering kind of the, the set of processes that are, a, that are able to help individuals cope um, and also encourages some type of workable interaction between the person and their environment. Um, and that happens through committed action. So um, I like how this figure outlines how um, ACT processes of acceptance, 
um, mindfulness and valued action can be expected to then enhance overall psychological well-being um, using that definition that Robertson and Cooper, um, which is a, a common um, definition that we see in the IO literature. Okay. Any um, questions at this point? Nothing yet. Okay. Um, we got one though. We'll right. be able to access this presentation after. Yeah, I will make sure um, that we we can figure out how to do that, right, Dennis? Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay. Um, um, all of you should actually be receiving a recording of this presentation right after we're done here. Um, oh, and we have one more question from too. from Nick. He says, "Are you going to show any yeah. case data?" Am I going to what? Show any single case data. Because um, the data that you've um, thus far is grouped, so. Uh, yeah, the um, the current literature has um, shown um, group-based data. So that's an area where I'm I'm hopeful that right now individuals who are collecting data are, are doing single case stuff. Um, and that's where I'm planning um, to go with it, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Great, great. Um, uh, sorry, we had one more. Aaron asked if we will have access to the slides and the handouts. Yes. Yeah, right. Um, so this slide should look pretty familiar to those of you who are um, OBMers. Um, if you're not an OBMer but a wannabe OBMer and you're joining us, um, you know that OBM is the uh, or you don't know, but here's the, the description um, that I use for OBM. So the application of the science of behavior to the performance of people at work. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to kind of use this as the starting point for uh, where we're going with the rest of the discussion, um, because we want to, um, I believe that we can incorporate act techniques into our OBM techniques without um, going astray from what OBM is meant to be. Um, so the precise measurement of performance can still happen. Um, we're still going to be collecting data and analyzing that data and using that data to make decisions um, and evaluate how well our change efforts um, are sustaining um, in the workplace. And again, this should look pretty familiar to everybody. Um, you know, using um, evidence-based coaching models and using applied behavior analysis inherently um, tends to evoke committed actions. So um, some of what we're already doing in OBM is likely to spur um, leaders and managers and coaches and other individuals to commit to actions that are um, aligned with values and aligned with Goal, their personal goals or goals of the organization. Um, so we might, um, you know, see that people, you know, take what they've learned through training or when we're clarifying job expectations um, that we, we see that um, that immediate effect on, on behavior. Um, we know, however, that antecedent interventions um, tend to be more temporary unless there are consequences in place um, that are tied to um, the outcomes and objectives of that change effort. And so um, what we want to be able to do is to um, incorporate behavioral coaching into our change efforts um, and our leadership development um, initiatives um, in order to make sure that we're obtaining better outcomes um, you know, for the duration of the program and um, after the intervention ceases, we want to see sustainability. Um, one of the things that um, I've found in my, my outside of academia and when I'm working with coaches and leaders and managers is that um, many of our traditional OBM interventions um, tend not to address, at least not directly, um, other contextual obstacles that can arise. Um, and impede um, behavior. So that would be um, kind of these inner experiences that, um, that show up. Um, so those difficult thoughts, feelings, emotions, 
um, some of kind of these um, conditioned avoidance um, responses or habits that we have, um, perhaps the lack of values clarification, um, and um, a lot of what I've encountered in, um, in working with others is that there's a lot of negative self-talk that tends to get people um, stuck. And so if we can incorporate ACT into our already existing OBM coaching models, um, I think we can improve the sustainability and enhance the effectiveness of our interventions in the long run. Yep. Okay, so Cheryl asks, what are some other diffusion techniques? Uh, she thinks of self-compassion, mindful meditation. How do you measure something like that other than scales? Uh, you have a scale you like best. Yeah, that's something that's not a part of this webinar, but something that I'd be happy to chat about um, off the webinar. Okay. Um, so some of the things um, that I have found in my conversations um, with leaders and managers is that these are the things that they tend to struggle with most that um, that can impede um, the, the work that um, that we've been brought in to consult with them on. Um, so, you know, um, and, and one of the things that we might um, notice and we might observe um, them doing overtly is engaging in certain types of avoidance behaviors. So um, if they are feeling anxious about any of the things that you see here listed on the screen, um, they might um, tend to skip out on meetings or avoid going to social events. Um, they might not be there for briefings. And because they start to engage in these avoidance behaviors, um, then those that they lead or manage, manage are going to see that and may start questioning their ability as a leader or a manager. Um, and so it can um, uh, result in reduced social standing um, among those that they um, coach, lead, and manage. And um, it, it, it becomes, you know, then because of that, because they might pick up on um, how they're being perceived by others, it might um, create this vicious avoidance cycle. Um, and so ACT is really meant to help leaders and managers develop better repertoires so that um, these anxious feelings or difficult feelings um, can show up, but at the same time, the leader is still able to act in an effective way. Um, and so we want to improve their behavioral flexibility. Uh, when I gave a um, perform, performance management slash leadership development workshop series this last fall. Um, these are some of the things that showed up um, for my group of leaders and managers. Um, and um, these are the, the, the internal experiences that they have that they felt kind of got in the way of them being able to move toward what was important to them. Um, in their leadership role. And so commonly I will, um, when I'm having this discussion with a group, these are some of the things that will um, inevitably turn up in those discussions and conversations, um, the types of thoughts that they have or the feelings that they have um, that, get in, that can get in the way. Um, sometimes they're able to allow those thoughts, feelings, um, emotions to be present while still engaging in effective manager behavior, um, but other times it reduces um, their effectiveness as a leader. And so one of the things that I um, do initially when I'm working with leaders and managers is uh, we look at value added change with regard to um, their, their role in the workplace. And um, what I thought was really interesting is that before I even knew what ACT was or that it existed, um, I had started doing um, some of this work um, just on my own because I, I understood the importance in my own behavior change efforts that if I wasn't really committed to my goal, if it didn't somehow um, have an imp a positive impact on my life at large, so to speak, 
um, I was I was more likely to kind of give up after a while. Um, and so um, one of the things that I do when I'm working with others is I, you know, I, I talk about the importance of identifying your why for behavior change. Um, and this really gets at the crux of knowing who you are and what you value as a person. And so we focus on um, the employment or work value domain um, when I'm working with leaders and managers. And, um, and I will ask them, uh, one of the first exercises that they do um, is they go through and kind of write down um, their thoughts in reference to the questions that you see on the screen. Um, in ACT, um, ACT distinguishes between concrete goals. So concrete goals are those things that are going to be achievable. They are obtainable. Um, and they distinguish that from values, which really um, kind of help guide us. Values are the compass that guide our actions. Um, and they guide behavior for an infinite amount of time. So values are never achieved. They simply um, apply to actions that we are taking in the present moment. Um, so you would have to, if, they, if you had a certain value um, related to your role in the workplace, you could take actions that would be aligned with that value every day at work. Um, so we tend to kind of create verbal goals that can be worked for and achieved as part of moving us um, in alignment with our values. But values um, are sort of at the foundation and they help us continue to define the goals that we set for ourselves. Um, distinguishing values from goals um, and defining values can also change the context in which individuals themselves evaluate the work that they do. Um, and leadership values can be assessed with questions um, such as, you know, what do you do to bring meaning to the community or to the workplace? Um, what do you want your tenure as a leader in this organization to stand for? And on the screen, I share a few um, other questions that I pose um, to the groups that I've worked with. Um, and one of the things then that I ask them is, you know, what actions can you take that will help you work toward this goal that are aligned with your values? Um, if you start looking at um, any of the references on ACT, um, there's this really handy tool, um, and it's called the ACT Matrix. And oh, I don't have that book down here with me, but on um, the reference slides, you'll see a picture of the essentials of the ACT um, book. And um, I've sort of adapted um, that matrix. And this is an activity um, that I use with my leaders, managers, and other individuals that I coach um, to help them um, learn this different, this perspective um, of ACT and, you know, begin to help them notice um, both their inner experiences and their external experiences. Uh, experiences. Um, and so the matrix really starts in the lower right hand corner um, with kind of that values identification and clarification. So here you can see the, the prompt that I give to uh, gave to this group was write down what is important to you in your role as an employee at um, St. Luke's Hospital. Um, and then we move over to the lower um, left hand quadrant. Um, where they start to reflect on those things that show up internally um, that get in the way, that get them um, potentially stuck um, toward moving um, to what they, toward what they value. Um, and then um, above the horizontal line, um, we have those things that we experience externally. And um, when you, when you look at the matrix, you'll note that you'll uh, find that they talk about sorting our um, our behavior 
um, sorting it as toward moves or away moves. And so you can see, I've called this my moving toward and away exercise. Um, but these are overt behaviors. So these are things that we can measure as behavior analysts and um, that individuals themselves can self monitor. Um, and they can monitor the, the behaviors that they're engaging in that either move them toward or away from who or what is important to them. Um, and away moves are not necessarily bad moves. Like those can be self, those can be protective um, moves. Like um, you encounter, um, you know, a, a, a car that's going to run a red light. Um, you would, you know, probably either run faster or not cross the street in that, in that, um, that case. Now that might move you away from getting to where you want to go. Um, but it's also something that in the short term is going to be uh, very effective in making sure that you don't get hurt. Um, there are also um, other ways that we cope with stress um, that could be um, helpful and move us toward um, something that we value, which might be a healthy lifestyle. Um, and in the short term might also be a way for us to um, reduce um, anxiety that we're feeling or panic type feelings that we're, that we're having. Um, and so the same um, behavior can be both in a way or toward move depending on the context. And um, so um, I really like this exercise as kind of a starting point to um, really help individuals increase their levels of self-awareness. Um, because one of the things that I find is that they're not even aware of the internal experiences that they're having as well as some of the um, the external um, ways in which they tend to um, avoid or attempt to get rid of um, those uncomfortable experiences. And so this is a nice first step. Um, and then once they've had some practice with that, um, I um, tend to focus on the upper right hand quadrant as an area of opportunity for um, pinpointing target behaviors. So I have them identify um, a current toward move um, that they want to increase or um, a new toward move that they want to establish. And then uh, from there, we make sure that that target behavior meets um, the criteria for an effective pinpoint um, to ensure that it's measurable, that it's objective, that it's um, something that's under their control um, and it's stated actively, you know, all those things that uh, we're familiar with in uh, behavior analysis. And so just kind of in, um, you know, closing, this is the last thing, um, just kind of a summary. Um, you know, leaders are consistently, leaders and managers are consistently given that, mes that message that they need to produce results for the organization. Um, and, and it really is important that they um, that they are able to demonstrate that they're moving in the direction of those goals. Um, however, you know, those goals are something that is likely to be achieved in the future. So either in the near future or the distance future, the distant future. Um, and the actions that they're taking today, the values oriented behavior um, that they can commit to is happening in the here and now. So it's happening in the moment. Um, and one of the things that I like to um, stress to leaders and managers is that leadership really um, is a process. It's not just about reaching the end goal, but it's also about how we go about reaching um, that goal. Um, so it's, um, it's happening in the here and now. It's um, not about simply about that final destination. destination. Um, if they want to be an effective leader, they need to um, commit to the actions that they're engaging in here and now um, and recognize how those moment to moment um, actions and behaviors um, influence their ability to continue to move forward um, and also influence um, the behavior of those that they are leading and managing. So with that, we have four minutes. Um, are there any um, questions directly related to the material that I covered? Julie, I think you can out your slide now, or maybe oh. I can do that. Yeah. Or stop sharing it. Yeah. Now. Awesome. Yeah. Now, but you're blacked out. Oh, okay. So they can't see me? Yeah, for some reason it's not showing you, but can you see the chat oh. now? 
Yes, I can see the chat. Um, okay. Jeremy asks, in experience, to what extent have members of different organizations um, been more or less likely to accept an ACT approach like this? Um, Jeremy, I've worked with, um, right now, um, I personally, because academia is my primary gig, um, I just do a little bit of coaching consulting up here in Duluth. And I've worked with a large hospital system as well as a small um, hospital clinic and both um, cohorts that I've done this with this this past year um, have been really accepting of it. It's, it's actually really interesting because at the beginning of each one of our uh, workshop sessions, um, employees after going through that initial matrix exercise, they commonly report to me um, their toward or their away moves. Um, and so that's been, um, they, they really like that distinction. So I think the fact that it allows them to be more self-aware of their behavior, um, has been, um, uh, probably one of the, the most positive things that I've, um, observed. For those of us that are relatively new to ACT and want to learn more, do you recommend any good literature? Erin, um, on my slides, I have, um, a a list of books, um, of a few books that I would highly recommend um, that you take a look at, um, as well as the ACBS website has a ton of free resources. Um, and yes, as Dennis noted, there are some great intros to act on the Behavioral Observations podcast. There is um, on the slides, I have a link to a free um, introductory course on ACT that's available through Praxis. Um, and um, and you can you can actually get I think one CEU for that as well. Um, Nick, I have not seen single subject data yet. Um, so to that question, that's something that I've um, been talking with a couple of other individuals about. Um, because what I would like to do is. Um, is get some of that um, single subject data um, in my work with um, with athletes um, or even with individual managers. So I just wanted to see how um, this past fall, my my um, introduction of the matrix was really just something that I wanted to see how it would go over and if they would accept it. So my plan uh, moving forward is to come up with um, a, a a research design to incorporate into um, future seminars. Um, Cheryl, you can use the you can use ACT um, on an individual level or with groups. Um, and um, one of the links that you'll see on the references is for the ACT, ACT Matrix Academy. And Kevin Polk, the original um, use of the of the ACT Matrix was for individual one-on-one um, -on -one coaching. Um, he has um, now um, also come out with the pro-social matrix, which is using it for group settings, which I guess I had been doing without even knowing that I was doing it. Um, so it's just a, a slightly different way of, of asking the questions when you're going through the four quadrants of the matrix. Um. For those that want to contact me about this material, I'm going to give you um, this email. You can also contact me via my academic email. Um, but if you don't want to get lost in that inbox, I would uh, suggest that you contact me uh, via Injul, uh, coaching at Gmail. Um, and I can send slides if they if, if you would like those in addition to the webinar uh, recording. Nick, I'd be happy to chat with you about, um, about why or how you might see this being uh, troubling to do single subject research. Because I think it really um, you know depends on what it is that you're measuring. You would be able to pinpoint um, specific measurable um, behaviors, just like we do with any other single case research, I think. Thanks, Gia. Does anyone else have any other questions?
Yeah, Nick, um, I agree with you. I see it a lot too. Um, not a lot of data because I think it's still so new. So I, I have heard from people that they are in the process of writing things up and getting them published. So this is, um, you know, coming outside of um, what they have done in clinical settings, which I'm sure you can find single case data there. Um, I just, I, I have stayed away from that literature and really just looked at the stuff that's been done in the workplace, which so far has been more group based versus single subject. Um, so I think um, this is this is the direction that we're moving, and now we just need um, need people to um, to do the research um, it, using single case designs. Right. Anyone else have uh, have questions? Let's see. There's another box down here. Oh, are we on schedule? I think we are. Okay. I think it was at the beginning, Julie. Thanks, Nick. What's that? Oh, okay. Um, for anybody who's still online, I do know that if you're going to ABAI, they have um, announced that they have uh, the, the day after, so it must be all day Tuesday, um, there is an apt conference following ABAI. Um, and if you go to the ACBS uh, website, they have um, links to several events for workshops, seminars, and trainings in apt. Okay. I think if that's it, um, thank you all for staying with me. And um, if you have any follow up questions, um, please send me an email. I'd be happy to connect with you and continue the discussion. Um, like I said, I just wanted to give a basic overview and, um, and indicate that I think that this is something that as OBMers, we should at least pay attention to and, um, and consider how we might integrate it. And um, as, um, you know, as some people have commented, um, also think about how we can um, include um, objective measures to go along with what we're already measuring in um, OBM. So thank you all. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, everybody, for attending our webinar. You will be receiving a recording of this right after we're done.